The topics and opinions expressed on the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4WN Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4WN Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4WN Radio. This is Beyond Confidence with your host, Divya Park. Do you want to live a more fulfilling life? Do you want to live your legacy and achieve your personal, professional, and financial goals? Well, coming up on Divya Park's Beyond Confidence, you will hear real stories of leaders, entrepreneurs, and achievers who have stepped into discomfort, shattered their status quo, and are living the life they want. You will learn how relationships are the key to achieving your aspirations and financial goals. Moving your career or business forward does not have to happen at the expense of your personal or family life, or vice versa. Learn more at www.diviapark.com and you can connect with Divya at contact at diviapark.com. This is Beyond Confidence, and now here's your host, Divya Park. Good evening, listeners. So fantastic to be here with you this evening. And today, we have a treat in store. So... I will be inviting our guest today. It's going to be a little different show today from our regular show. And I again want to thank you for your generosity, for getting the books. I really appreciate you getting the Entrepreneur's Garden and Expert to Influencer because all the profits from the books are going to entrepreneurs impacted by COVID-19. So thank you for joining hands with me and supporting them. And also, I just want to run it by that one hour invitation that I have asked you. I am just one hour of time per month to help somebody else with no strings attached. And it can be anything. It could be smiling that you could come from maybe five smiles a day to strangers throughout the month and taking that five, five minutes a day, pack it up, folks. And it's important to unpack this influence and inspiration, the movement, because it's critical at this time that we all come together. So let's welcome Shelby and Eleanor. Hi. Hi, Divya. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for having us here. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. I'm delighted to be It's a pleasure to have you both. So, Eleanor, usually we start out from... Pardon me? It's breaking up a lot. Yes, we're breaking up a little bit. Divya, can you repeat the question? She's um, still... <laughs> Yeah, you're frozen. Okay. Sorry, ladies. Divya's frozen for a moment. We'll get her back unfrozen in a minute. While we are waiting, uh, Shelby, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm um, a retired music teacher, um, church organist, choir director. Um, my background is, is teaching and music. Uh, right now, I do play the piano with a, a fellow um, music teacher. We do forehand duets on one keyboard, which is a lot of fun for community events and um, senior citizens and so on. Um, I started writing two years ago um, and always wanted to write and um, so finally found time to do it. Awesome. And thank you for your Thank you for imparting your wisdom to others who I'm sure went on to do wonderful things. It's fun teaching children. And adults. I, I enjoy, I've done Bible studies and so on with adults. So um, I don't know. I enjoy people in general. Okay. Can you hear That's us? Wonderful. Awesome. So what we were talking about is that from your childhood, Eleanor, do you recall any moments that stand out even today? I'm sorry, I have to hear that again. Uh, you, uh, you're asking me a question, right? Yes. Okay, would you mind repeating it? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I can definitely repeat that. So the question is, do you recall any moments from your childhood that stand out even today in your memory? Yes. Um, when I was voted the prettiest in my class, and I was shocked, and I went running home and skipping home and told my parents, and my mother said, okay, tell your dad when he comes home, he will want to hear it. And I couldn't wait until my daddy came home so I could tell him I was voted the prettiest girl in the class. And he said to me, I don't care. He said, what you're born with is not important to me. Uh, and he said, as long as you get A's, that's the important thing. What you become with yourself is the important thing. And Divya, I never, I never forgot that. Oh, that is so profound, right? Because with age, we do tend to lose the concept of beauty. It's totally in the eyes of the beholder, as they say. If someone to look that with age, you're maturing and becoming more dignified and distinguished, and that's another story. It's just those social norms that tie us down with all these expectations. What a beautiful story. How about you, what? Shelby? Well, I was sitting here trying to remember. <laughs> I'm your typical, um, atypical 78-year-old uh, grandma. So when I was young, wow, that was a long time ago. But I was reminded that when in elementary school, well, until I was in college, I was very, very thin. I think I weighed 95 pounds when I graduated from high school. So when I was uh, in grade school, the kids would, would call me skinny or something like that. And I said, why are they always bothering me, calling me skinny? There's this guy, over, one of the boys, he was skinny as uh, I was, you know. They didn't bother him, but I never did figure it out. <laughs> um, but um, I wish I was thinner now. <laughs> and let me ask you this. Why is that? Why Shall is that? Yeah, well, why do you want to be thin right now? Well, when my six-year-old grandson um, last summer says, looked up at me and he says, Grammy, are you pregnant? <laughs> it kind of hit home. <laughs> I said, no, Luke, I'm not, but um, I look like it, don't I? And he says, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, from the mouth of the babes, right? It's, uh, yeah, right. This reminds it's me of a story. My, no, it's all in my stomach and, <laughs> and <laughs> exercise more, but you don't get much exercise sitting at the computer work, writing. <laughs> you said it. It's hard. It's hard to get that exercise in day in, day out. And sometimes... It's about just kind of creating that time that even scheduling an appointment that, okay, I got to do this. And it's hard, mm -hmm. especially if it's cold outside and the gyms may be closed or something. I definitely can understand that. Mm -hmm. So that reminds me of a story, how sometimes you can put your foot in the mouth. And mm -hmm. I've done it several times. So one time we were at a gathering and this wonderful lady, she, you know, she was my friend and I was seeing her after some time. And I heard somebody say, oh yeah, she, I just heard half of the conversation, which of course kind of told me, this is when I was in my early twenties. I heard the word pregnant. So I see her, I go to her, rushing to her and say, oh, congratulations, what great news. Um, when are you expecting? And oh my God. She was stone faced and she said, I just had my baby. And she walked away. I'm like, okay. First of all, never ever listen to just half conversation. <laughs> and that's something I learned not to ever call anybody that. So I can definitely see that. I've done so, that. Yeah, yeah, I've done that too. <laughs> oh, you've done that too. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. So, <laughs> Eleanor. Let's still kind of uh, hear your story as uh, as you grew up, you know, what were you interested in? What was your career? And just kind of tell us from there till now. Um, well, I was, my career when I was young was to just study hard 
and do get perfect uh, scores and everything. My looks or what I looked like, whether it was fat or thin, was irrelevant to my parents. My parents pushed academia on me. I also um, was given piano lessons. I asked for ballet lessons, but they said piano lessons would give me more information in life. And I continued in piano until I went to Juilliard as uh, um, at 16, I was at Juilliard. And then I also went to an Ivy League college because I graduated first in my class from a large public high school. So uh, I didn't know what I wanted, but I knew I had to excel or try to excel in everything I touched. And that drove me. I wasn't interested in my physical looks. In fact, I was wearing braids while I was 15. And when I went to Vassar, which was um, a college, I walked in with braids and uh, uh, into the class and I looked around and I, I was certainly out of it. And I still remember one girl took me under her wing and she said, you need a haircut, you need a bob, I think she called it. And when I went home, I told my parents I was cu cutting my hair and I came back with a bob and they, they, some of the kids didn't recognize me at college. So I think you might say I was back with socially, but I really wasn't. I did have boyfriends. I just presented myself very intellectually. I did not present myself physically, although so obviously some boys found that attractive anyway. So it didn't seem to make any difference. So after college, I'm from the generation that uh, Shelby is. I was very upset I did not have a, an engagement ring on my finger. <laughs> we grew up in the time where we were supposed to graduate from college. I went to an all girls school and we were supposed to get married, raise a family, have children quickly. And the husband was the breadwinner and we were the caretaker of the home, and which I did. And I, I, I worked for a short time. I was a school teacher, a high school teacher. When I became pregnant, I got married. When I became pregnant, uh, I had my children. And then my husband and I lived as a team for 44 years. And um, when my kids got to be school age, I went back to work. I went to work. I worked as a teacher before I got married and I went back and I be, I took a job that was a commission job. So I could be home at three o'clock for my kids. So that's how I was juggling because what came first was my family. The money I was making was secondary. It was a help, but I was not a career. It was not a career. And then life went on. And somewhere, I was still married. I, was, I became 60 years old. I went back to work as a, as a, as a real estate broker. Which I was 60 years old. And I said, I'm bored. I'm going to go to law school. And I was afraid to tell my husband. My kids were grown up and they were out of the house. Um, I was afraid to tell my husband that I wanted to go to law school because he expected dinner on the table and, and he was a wonderful guy, but that's the way we had. So I studied for the law bar, the, the LSATs. And when I got my grades, I applied to law schools at night and I did get into one. And then I made a very good dinner. And when my husband had dinner, I sat, I said, he was sitting down. I said, honey, I have something to tell you. And he said, what? I said, I applied to law school, I got in, and I want to go. It's a good thing he was sitting down. <laughs> and he's a very sweet guy. <laughs> oh, my God, how can you? It's going to interfere. You know I want to move. I want to go to Florida. Um, I want to sell my business. I mean, I said, don't worry, sweetheart. If you sell your business, I will, I will change law schools. Or if I finish law school here, I can always practice law in Florida. It will not work, interfere with your plans. So then he said, 
what do I do about dinner? Because I was going to night school. I was going to go to night school. Um, I didn't want to go in the daytime um, because I had to work actually in the daytime to pay for night school. So he said, what do I do for dinner? I said, honey, don't worry about it. I will, I will make dinner in the morning, which I did. I would broil the chicken and I got everything out. And I said, all you have to do is reheat it. So he said, how do I reheat it? I said, I will buy a microwave. We didn't even have a microwave. I said, I will buy a microwave. I'll teach you how to use it. And all you have to do is put it in there. So I bought a microwave. He learned how to use a microwave. I went through four years of, of school and he was very proud of me. He was very proud of me that I went to law school and he started, I could feel it. He, he, he was just a sweet boy. And my grandchildren came to my graduation and till this day, they call me grandma, grandma S. <laughs> oh, that's such a beautiful story that even with all this, uh, you went to law school and that's phenomenal. And that's what I wanted to bring to people's attention that age does not mean that there are any limitations. You can do anything that you want at any age. So how oh. did it make you feel after passing Eleanor? After my husband, I'm sorry, after my husband's passing, you said? After, after you got your law degree, how did you feel? I'm sorry, yes, I'm sorry, how did I feel after? How did you feel after yeah. getting your law degree? Um, I felt renewed. I felt excited about learning something new. I made new friends. I was not nervous, oddly enough, even because I, when I went to court, I was older than the judges there. <laughs> and, and I actually had one or two friends who were judges. So, uh, and I know, and I appeared before one before the bench, and she said, I think I ought to transfer this case. <laughs> uh, she, and she, she called recusal. So, you know, um, I have to make this very clear because, as you know, I'm now a senior influencer or commentator. Um, it, I had more confidence older than I might have had if I were an attorney younger. I, I was, I've been trying to figure out why, but I think I just brought a certain like, this is gravy. And this is something that I'm very proud of. And look at me, I'm practicing law. You know, there's a positivity that was about me that might not have happened if I went to law school first. Yep, life doesn't stop. So what a wonderful story and such an inspiration to folks who may be thinking, oh, gosh, I'm at this age, I can't do it now. If you have a dream, of course, you know, you got to say like, so for example, let's say if I had a dream to become an astronaut right now, I doubt it that I can become. So it's important to check your dreams along with a little dash of reality. So Shelby, tell us your life story. <laughs> Well, when I was about uh, 10 or 11, my mother said to me, if I could save enough money to buy a piano, she said, would you take piano lessons? I said, mom, I'd love to play the piano. So a few months later, she says, come on, we're going to go and we're going to get you a piano. So I started playing. I was like 11, 12, somewhere in there, seventh grade. And um, I just really loved it. And my mom all those years loved to hear me practice. By the time I was um, about, I had taken about three years, so I was about 15. She said, now you're going to have to pay me back by teaching your brother and your sister <laughs> to play the piano. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was a disaster. Until uh, I finally said, okay, I put my coat and hat on, went out the back door, came around, rang the doorbell, and they let me in. And that worked a little bit better, but, <laughs> um, but anyway, so by the time I was 16, the church needed a, an organist, and I had been accompanying the, the youth choir, and another two girls were learning to play the organ, so we took turns. Uh, every third Sunday was my Sunday, and um, uh, it wasn't long until the other two quit, and I was left, so I put in 23 years as organist, and that Presbyterian Church that I I could say I grew up in. Um, I wanted 
I thought I wanted to get a music degree when I was a senior, and I was accepted into Michigan State and Central and Oakland University um, uh, for being a music major. But um, my parents um, said, you're going to Oakland University. It's five miles down the road. You're going to live at home, save some money, blah, blah, blah. So the second year, Oakland said, sorry, but we're not going to have uh, music. And while well, you're, you're going to have to transfer or change your major. So I became an elementary school teacher. And uh, I graduated and I taught first grade. I taught third grade and then. I finally grew up and I taught sixth grade for six years. <laughs> In the beginning, I was just too shy to try with the older kids, but the younger kids, I just, you know, loved them. And my two brother, my brother and sister were too younger than me. And so I was used to that. So I taught um, and then I got married uh, after I'd been teaching about four years. And um, we did not were not able to have children for a long time and finally uh eight years after we were married we had our daughter and i took two years uh leave of absence to stay home with her but i was pregnant <laughs> with my son at that time and so i had to make a decision my sister said she would be you know keep my two kids with her two kids while i taught school and uh so i went in and um prepared the room for school to start. Uh, it was the day before Labor Day weekend. And the, the principal was a real good friend of mine. I had taught with her earlier. She says, Shelby, I detect that you really don't want to come back. And I said, well, I do have some misgivings, you know. And she said, well, you go back to that room and you think about it. And when before you leave, I want you to tell me yes or no, you're going to come or you're not going to. And I said, well, it's kind of late to tell you now. School starts on Tuesday. She said, doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Do what you want. So um, by the time I got done with the room and so on, I went back to her and I said, you know what? I really don't want to do this. So um, I quit. I went home. I picked up my kids at my sister's and I said, I decided I'm not going to teach. <gasps> Oh, she said she'd had four kids. So she was, oh, I'm so glad she said. So that was where that was. So then I taught. I had a, the son. I had the, the uh, daughter. And then uh, when my son started el elementary school, I decided, well, actually, it was before that. My sister came to me about um, when the kids were about five. She says, I'm going to go and study music at Oakland, where they now had the, the program. Why don't you come and take organ lessons? And she knew that I really wanted to be challenged, you know, by learning some Bach. I could play practically anything it was handed to me, but I couldn't do the Bach and the Mendelssohn and all that. So I went and signed up again and started taking classes. And in 1987, then I added my bachelor of music degree. And here's a story that was very interesting. I, I got my degree in music at 43. And it's in organ and in voice, a double major. So I, I got a second bachelor's degree. And the, the funny thing is that when I was in college, a friend of my mother's told me, well, you'll lose your voice by the time you get to be 40. <laughs> and so I guess I proved it wrong because I I was 45, I think, when I got my my music degree in voice. So I, I thought, well, I guess I showed you. <laughs> but anyway, I went back to teaching. And this time I went back as a music teacher, an elementary music teacher. And I taught 15 years uh, as a music teacher. Uh, I had taught preschool before I got the job in the public school and um, through seventh grade. Well, the year that I taught seventh grade music was the year that I decided I'm not doing this again. <laughs> and I was going to retire before I had to teach seventh graders again. <laughs> and I did teach one more year, but then my husband was eight years older than me and he was retired and he wanted to moved to Tennessee. So mm -hmm. I retired also in 2000. We moved to Tennessee and we built a roundhouse. <laughs> we had taken a home building course so that we could tell when the builders 
you know, what they were doing and making sure they were doing the right thing and everything. So that was quite an experience. So we like lived there then 17 years and um, he passed away then uh, in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, suddenly um, he was ill. We were traveling from Michigan back to Tennessee and uh, he refused to go to the doctor. And by the time he did go, it was too late. It was a bad pneumonia case. So I moved I'm sorry back. For your loss. I'm sorry. I'm saying sorry for your loss. Thank you. Um, so I uh, suddenly became a, a widow. Hmm. Did you feel like you were thrown in, catapulted into the unknown when you became a, a widow, Eleanor? That's how I felt. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You and I, we read each other's books. And <laughs> the first part, the first chapter is. I call my first chapter parachuting back in because that's how I felt back into dating. And also uh, Shelby also had that feeling of like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had, um, I decided to do the internet dating and ended up getting scammed. And when I, a year later found out how huge a problem it was, I um, decided to write my book to see if I could help other people. Uh, avoid that experience. And in the process of writing the book, I said, well, maybe I ought to tell them how a 75 year old woman happened to be internet dating, you know? <laughs> so I started then with uh, the death of my husband. <laughs> so Very nice. it's, it's so you there. guys have, um... right. Go ahead. so you okay. guys have gone through a lot. May I uh, piggyback my story on top of Shelby's? Because sure. I, was, I was working as she was. I was working when well, she was retired when her husband died, but I was still working as an attorney and my life was fine. Um, my, I'm, I was the same age as my husband. He was 74 when he died and I was 74 at the time. And he had not been ill. He was in good shape, but life took him and he died. We were married 44 years. So um, after he died, I, I, I kind of didn't show it. I didn't go through the typical grieving process. I didn't carry on. I did a couple odd things. Like I suddenly moved out of our bedroom and I moved into a studio couch. I just didn't want to sleep in that big bed. It just felt strange. And then um, after the memorial service, I was wearing black everywhere I went, but I would get up, get dressed in black, go down to the lobby. I live in Manhattan in a doorman building. And I would sit there for about a half an hour in black with a black hat on and greet people who left the house, you know, the building who knew my husband passed away and they're walking their dogs, whatever they were doing. And I just sat there, greeted them, then got up and would go upstairs and start working. I either go to work or have breakfast or whatever. So I did those odd things, but that was all. And then I guess I felt lonely because I didn't feel anything, but I, I was talking to girlfriends and one said to me, I'd like to introduce you to someone. I know he's going to call you. Uh, and uh, may I give him your name? Are you ready? So I said, well, Marilyn, I call her Nancy in the book. I said, I need to make a phone call first. So she said, sure. So I hung up and I called my two sons. I don't know why. I, I was asking permission. So I call one son up. He's like, he was 45 at the time. And I said, Quincy, darling, I said, Marilyn, her name is Nancy in the book. Nancy call wants to fix me up with a blind date. What do you think? He said, sure, mom, sure. I said, okay. Then I hung up. My heart was pounding. I don't know why my heart was pounding. Then I called my younger son who was 42 at the time or so. I mean, men in their 40s. And, I'm, and I see them from time to time, you know, I wasn't doing much with them babysitting or anything. It was just, you know, loving them. So I said, Nick, I said, um, Marilyn wants to fix me up on a blind date. What do you think? He said, great, mom, that's great. <laughs> that, 
I hung up and I called her back and I said, it's a go. Like, here's my number. You know, I have my number. Tell him to call me. And that's how I started dating again. Very nice. So let's uh, talk about uh, the different generations that you have seen in your lifetime. So as far as X generation is concerned or baby boomers are concerned, can you share, Eleanor, in your own words, what's the difference between the generation in your time and generation today who may be your grandkids? Well, the generations are very different. Uh, my sons, who are the 40s, are very different from, from what I was in the 40s. Uh, they're more open in some ways and more cavalier than I was. I was very conservative in my 40s. Um, they're getting married later and having their children later. Both my sons got divorced and remarried, which is something I never would have considered. My parents, I think, would have killed me. My parents had the attitude that if he doesn't drink and he's not a heavy smoker and he doesn't beat you, you stay married and you make it work. A marriage is not something that you, you take lightly, but it's a job that you both have to work at. And that was my attitude. Yeah, thick and thin, I, I was at my husband's side and I made it work and I think he made it work too. It wasn't as narcissistic in my mind as my kids are in, within their world. And, and um, I think kids today get married later and I think they, 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 they care less about having children um, as a group than I did. I, it was very important to me to have children and to have to be married, to have a man's last name, you know, attached to a child. And so that's one of the major things I think about um, uh, the differences in generations today. Right. And from terms of characters, how would you rate? Because always the older generation thinks that they're better than the younger generation and younger generation thinks that older generation doesn't know anything. How would you bridge the gap? And well, partly I became what I, I won't call myself a senior influencer. I call myself a senior commentator because I think I, I developed a mission, I, not just because I wrote the book dating and mating after Medicare, you know, an incredible, uh, an inc a journey into an incredible world of, da of dating, loving, and marrying for six people over 60s. That's a chronicle of, of, of all of us seniors. But my, I want my kids to read that. And even my grandkids are reading that because I want the generation behind me, your generation probably is just behind me, to understand that we are full-blooded people. We're not over the hill. Some of us are over the rainbow. <laughs> and to, be, to be honest, Divya, I'm, I'm here, I can tell you that being 83, which is what I am now, I think this is the happiest time of my life. And I want you to hear it. I want your audience to hear it. And I want my kids to hear it. And I want to tell it, I want to shout it from every rooftop. That's fantastic. <laughs> and so, Shelby, yeah, I can you share like, your thoughts on the different generations and how do you foresee bridging those gaps? My my son and my daughter are about the same age as your, your son, your two sons. Um, my son is 42, my daughter is 44. Um, and they had totally opposite opinions. Mm -hmm. I asked them, my daughter first, about uh, what would you think if I tried internet dating? <gasps> no, mom, you don't want to do that. And she went into all of this. Oh, you'll get, you know, they'll rob you and blah, blah, blah. And no, 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 no. You're, you need more time for grieving. So I, okay. So I went upstairs and I talk, called my son. Well, what do you think? Oh my gosh. She yelled at me in the, <laughs> in the phone. No, mom, no, you don't want to do that. And I said, well, you met your wife on, on a mat, you know, on a dating site. Well, that's different, mom, but no, it's not for you. Don't you dare. <laughs> wow. It, it took them, it took them two years, three years, my daughter, I think to, 
uh, except um, that I would, she would at first, the first year, she didn't want me to bring any, any man around the family at all. She didn't want to meet any of them. And uh, then finally, I would just about uh, fainted when she said, well, why don't you ask so-and-so to come to our 4th of July thing? And I said, what? And so I, by that time, I figured she was starting to accept. Um, that was, I don't take orders very easily. So I went <laughs> ahead with my internet dating anyway. <laughs> uh, despite that, I knew they didn't like it and they didn't want it. But um, two years later, my son, he went through a divorce and then was um, looking at internet dating. So it was kind of fun. We were comparing notes. <laughs> and uh, um, his opinion of what he was doing was very different than my own. And I tried to tell him, you need to relax and have more fun and forget a, you know, about being serious all the time. Enjoy it. It's a game. It's flirting, learning, you know, practicing your flirting. So it's, it's, it's good. Just take your time. You don't have to get married tomorrow or find a, you know, relationship tomorrow. Just enjoy it. But um, he's learning. He's uh, on and off again, you know, with the dating sites and, uh, you know, they don't listen to their mother very well. And they say, I don't listen to my kids very well either. <laughs> Obviously, since I did the internet dating and they didn't want me to do that. Um, I'm glad they've come around. Uh, they're, they're coming around. And um, now they have met um, probably three of the guys that I have dated. And they've been okay with it. But. I know it's, it's uncomfortable. I'm not real comfortable yet. Um, and I don't think they are, but they're trying. They're trying. Shelby, how many years have you, has it been since your husband passed away and since you started dating again? All right. Uh, well, we were, he died uh, two weeks before our 50th wedding anniversary for one thing. And oh. uh, that was in July of 2016. Oh. So we're, um, was that four years now? Or seven, eighteen. We'll be. I guess it'll be four years. Um, My husband died in two thousand eleven, so it's yeah, ten years. Ten years. Like yeah, that. I've had two wow. boys. So, guys, uh, we are nearing. Pardon? We are nearing to the end of our show, so I'd like to invite you to share. Each of you share your contact information if uh, our listeners want to reach out and share your books. Well, I, I'd love for folks to go to Amazon or their local bookstore or read the reviews of my book on Amazon because it'll enlighten you. The name of the book is Secrets of Dating and Mating After Medicare. And it's my journey along a hundred other folks that I interviewed over five years. So it's Secrets of Dating and Mating After Medicare, or you can find it under Eleanor Vale. And because of the book, I ended up starting a website called ResetMyClock.com. ResetMyClock.com, where <laughs> seniors come to get back in the game of life. And it's tips. It's, it's a community-based uh, interactive website where you will write sh uh, travel places you've been to or books you have read that you think your age group would enjoy and get to know. And I'll be talking about this show on that website and recommending that folks look at it because beyond confidence is something that um, that seniors really need to look at and, and let themselves go and enjoy themselves. It is our time. You said it, it's our time. Now that's good to know. And so many times uh, people Forget that as the years go by, it doesn't mean that life stops. It's life to be lived. True. So thank you for sharing that. It's time for us to let loose and live our lives the way we want to and feel we really have. We should have a bucket list. We should do that. We should fulfill it. And every time we do something on our bucket list, put another one on it. Keep that <laughs> list long. 
Amen. <laughs> my book All is right. called, Can I talk about mine now? Uh, yes, learning, learning to Dance in the Rain. And I learned to dance during my time of navigating my grief. That's what helped my exercise. That's what helped me to get through and meet new people because I relocated from Tennessee to Michigan to be close to my daughter. Um, the first I, my book is in four acts. They, <laughs> the first act, of course, is explaining about my husband's last four days alive and the the funeral and the planning and the business that was all involved in, you know, immediately after he died. And then the second part of the second act is a guide for helping people to improve themselves. Uh, getting their confidence back. Um, we talked about uh, earlier uh, about uh, I wanted, I thought I would rather be thin now. Well, how many people do you talk to and say, hmm, you like your body? And they'll say, no, oh, you know, I don't like this or I don't like that. Or like, so in my book, I help them to figure out the things that are good about them uh, and so on. As, so they're preparing and thinking, I give thought provoking questions so they can re assess their options and decide what they want to do to have a fulfilling next chapter of their life after Medicare. I love that, Eleanor, I love that. <laughs> the third act gets into issues about dating again and online dating, the nuts and bolts of doing it. And I think it's a wonderful service. I really do. It's a good way to meet people. And I give guidelines for safe and successful um, internet dating experience. And I also give um, a lot of uh, pointers for avoiding those scammers because you're going to have them. I thought I was a darling of the internet when I first signed up because I got so many messages right away. And then within two weeks, they were all scammers, I noticed. So I learned a lot. I have uh, 28 uh, red flags for spotting a scammer, as, uh, you know, as soon. So it has a lot of helpful uh uh, strategies for dealing with grief and healing, uh, developing your confidence back. Uh, I lost mine, as I said, um, and um, for safe, um, keeping your financial and emotional and your uh, physical health and uh, uh, protecting yourself while you do all of those things. One thing is don't give your last name, ladies, until after you met that person and know that it's so uh, my friend tells me, be sure you right. any no, information. It's fantastic. So all, since we are, yeah, we're getting close to the end of the show. So if you want to share we have a website learning to, dance, learning to dance in the rain dot org. And I appreciate Thank hearing from everybody. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This was fun. <laughs> Thank you. It was fun. Thank you, Shelby and Eleanor, for joining us. And, of course, thank you, listeners. Do reach out to us and let us know if you are looking for any stories and specifically. So we'd be happy to meet your requests and see what we can do here. And thank you, Rebel, for making the show possible. And until next time, take thank care. You. Be well. <laughs> Bye. Thanks again. <laughs> Thank you for being part of Beyond Confidence with your host, Divya Park. We hope you have learned more about how to start living the life you want. Each week on Beyond Confidence, you hear stories of real people who have experienced growth by overcoming their fears and building meaningful relationships. During Beyond Confidence, Divya Park shares what happened to her when she stepped out of her comfort zone to work directly with people across the globe. She not only coaches people how to form heart connections, but also transform relationships to mutually beneficial partnerships as they strive to live the life they want. If you are ready to live the life you want and leverage your strengths, learn more at www.divyapark.com. And you can connect with Divya at contact at divyapark.com. We look forward to you joining us next week, Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time.